Good morning, church. Thank you guys for being here with us. Uh, We're glad you're here. And uh, before we get started and jump into today's message, I wanted to share with you a couple things that are going on at ABC to get you guys plugged in and connected here at the church. The first is we're going to be hosting a Sunday lunch uh, on Sunday, June 5th, right here at the church after the second service. Uh, I would ask that you just consider joining us. A great opportunity. We'll provide the food. You guys come and meet some new folks or people you guys haven't connected with in a long time. Uh, and if you come to the 8 or the 9 o'clock service, we would encourage you guys to come back. Uh, it's a cool opportunity for community and friendship and uh, just a chance to connect with one another um, over a meal. So uh, again, Sunday lunch uh, on Sunday, June 5th after the second service. The next is a cry for help. Uh, We need help uh, with volunteers for kids ministry. As we approach the summer season uh, and schedules change and people take off and vacations happen, we lose a lot of our volunteers and it takes a lot of people to make our kids ministry work here at ABC. Uh, Sandy and her team work feverishly to make sure that your kids are cared for and uh, if you've been blessed in the past, if you've had your kids come through kids ministry in the past, um, it's a cool opportunity to give back and serve now. So we're just asking you to consider that prayerfully. Uh, If you'd like to join our team, it doesn't have to be every Sunday, but we'd love to have uh, as many of you that are interested and able uh, to join us and be part of our kids ministry teaching team and volunteer team. So uh, you can sign up at the office, you can call us, you can email sandy at sandy at abcchurch.org. Again, we'd love to have you guys join us for kids ministry volunteering here at ABC Church. Uh, and lastly, I was um, I had the opportunity this past weekend to take a group of guys, 40, uh, here from ABC up to Hume Lake. And um, what a, an amazing opportunity uh, for us to connect with God and with others. There was a bunch of guys that have been at this church for a long time and many new uh, men that have not been to Hume Lake ever. Uh, and it was an amazing experience. Um, we are so thankful. So thank you guys uh, for coming. And thank you to the families that made it possible uh, for those guys to attend, from the wives and the families that are out there that allowed those men to come and join us. Uh, we, are, we are truly grateful. So thank you very much. And as you head into the Sunday morning, hope you have a great day. Good morning, ABC family. Thanks for tuning in today. We're so grateful that you continue to tune in and to listen and to submit yourself to the Lord, trusting that these online messages are part of His plan for your ongoing sanctification. Today we're going to continue teaching and preaching our way through Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. So if you have your Bible close, why don't you grab that and open it up to Matthew 5. We'll begin looking at verse 21 together. And while you're turning there, let me just state that expectations matter, don't they? I mean, people's expectations of us can be a form of motivation. You talk to any coach, uh, most recently I heard from one of our elders, Mark Miranda, who's a baseball coach, And he says that when he's coaching his team, it doesn't matter where he sets the bar of expectation. What the the end result is, is that the players will rise or fall to meet that bar. So if he sets the bar here, they will rise their performance level right up to that bar, to those expectations that he places on them. And he's realized that over the years, if he raises that bar, his players will tend to answer that call and come right up to meet the bar of expectations. I've also seen this in my own life. Um, The final weekend of April, I had the privilege of running a Ragnar race with a team of 12 guys, uh, mostly from here at ABC. If you don't know what that is, it's just a 200-ish mile long relay race. Uh, The the race is segmented into 36 segments. There's usually 12 people on a team, which means each runner runs three times. And for some reason, somebody assigned me as runner 12 this year, which meant I got to cross the finish line. And I was on a team with guys that were much faster than me, much younger than me. They're legit runners. And in fact, I'm just the old grandpa on the team, right? (laughs) These guys are amazing. And by the way, we came in, in our class of 247 teams, we came in third. So these guys are good. They're great. But they let me run the final leg and cross the finish line. And some of them just hadn't run quite enough miles yet, so they... There was four of them that chose to run right alongside of me all four and a half miles so that we all crossed that finish line together. And let me tell you that they raised the bar of my expectations for how fast I would run and how much I would run on that last leg. 
I honestly wanted to walk a section of it, but my pride wouldn't let me. <laughs> they had raised the bar of expectations and we ran through that end together. All this to say, expectations matter. And today, as we look at Matthew chapter 5, we find here that Jesus is raising the bar on anger and on reconciliation. Jeff made it real clear last week that Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, but he came to fulfill it. It wasn't going to relax. It wasn't going to pass away. The law actually mattered. It still characterizes that conduct that is true of the citizens of God's kingdom. And you see, the scribes and the Pharisees knew this. They knew that God's law mattered, but they had reduced the reach of that law to just a few outward expressions, to a list of human traditions. For instance, they knew that God had commanded them to honor mother and father, but they had said that whatever financial resources they were going to use to steward to honor father and mother, those were considered as korban, or in other words, they had been given to God. So you can read about this in Mark chapter 7, beginning at verse 9. And in the end, what the scribes and Pharisees had done is reduced the law to an outward expression, where in the name of God, they were able to disobey God and dishonor their parents. That's why Jesus says, your righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. So over the next several weeks, Jesus will continue to unpack here in Matthew chapter 5 the details of what it looks like to live as citizens of the kingdom. In fact, the next six paragraphs are going to start with, you have heard that it is said, and continue with Jesus saying, but I say to you. And in every case, what you have heard is some aspect of the Mosaic law some aspect of what God says will characterize citizens of his kingdom. And what Jesus says, I say to you, what follows there is a clear statement about just how far the bar has been raised above the teachings of the scribes and the Pharisees. So Jesus did not come to lower God's standards to make it easier for us to enter the kingdom of heaven. That is not what Jesus is doing here. That's not what he is about. But Jesus came to show us that it's impossible for us to reach or meet or clear this bar of expectations, this bar of conduct that is suitable for the citizens of God's kingdom. To do that by mere human effort, it can't be done. And Jesus will make that very clear to us today. Why can't it be done by human effort? Because the Bible is very clear that apart from God, apart from the miraculous work of renewal of God in our lives, we're dead. We're spiritually dead. And dead people can't live. So since they can't live, there's no way they could ever live as citizens of God's kingdom. You see, with man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So today we see that Jesus raises the bar on anger and on reconciliation. So let's pray. We're going to turn to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at verse 21 and following. And as we turn there, let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning acknowledging that you are sovereign over your creation, and that includes us. Thanking you for your word that you've preserved for us over centuries, thousands of years, and trusting, Lord, that your word is the means of our sanctification, our ongoing growth in holiness. So we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would tune our ears to your voice now, and that you would show us what it looks like to live as a citizen of your kingdom. We pray these things for the good of your church and for the glory of your name. Amen. Reading from Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable of judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So, 
If you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you that you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. So here in this passage this morning, we see about the law, Jesus raises the bar from murder to anger. We see this in verses 21 and 22. He says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. In these verses, Jesus starts out, you have heard that it is said. And in each of these statements, he's quoting one aspect of the law. In this particular verse, he's quoting the sixth commandment, that those ten commandments that Moses received from God, on Mount Sinai, and you can read this in Exodus 20, verse 13, as well as Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 17. So Jesus says, you've heard it said, in fact, you've probably heard the scribes and the Pharisees quote this sixth commandment, you shall not murder, and whoever does is liable to judgment. And Jesus here explains what this judgment is like. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, beginning at verse 8, the law explains what this judgment looks like. It's a description of the process of judgment between one kind of homicide and another. It's a judgment that is carried out by Levitical priests, so the priests of that day, and the judge who is in office at that time. And the penalty for breaking the sixth commandment is death. We read about this in Numbers chapter 35, verse 31, makes it very clear. Uh, Moses writes here in Numbers 35, Moreover, you shall accept no ransom for the life of a murderer who is guilty of death, but he shall be put to death. So the price for killing someone is the death of the one who is the murderer. Jesus goes on to say, But I say that everyone who is angry with his brother is liable to that same judgment. So the law says murder, Jesus says anger, the punishment for both is judgment. Jesus raises the bar. You see, the scribes and the Pharisees had had reduced the idea of righteousness just to certain outward behaviors. And this is why Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So the bar of righteousness has been raised from murder to anger. Jesus raises the bar. And now if we're honest, this bar feels impossibly high. All of a sudden we wonder, how does this jive with the God of grace? And we start to feel uncomfortable with Jesus' teachings here on the Sermon on the Mount. We start to feel uncomfortable with trying to live according to his teachings. I just can't live like that. We recognize it, and that's exactly Jesus' point. You will never be able to reach the standard of God's righteousness in your own strength. We need Jesus to reach this bar as our substitute. So now we might ask, well, does this mean that I just live however I want? Since Jesus reached this bar as my substitute, can I just live however I want? The answer is no. Because the text is clear, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to the judgment. And you might object, well, does this mean that anger is sin? Is that what that means? Is Jesus saying that anger is in himself sin? No, Jesus himself got angry. And in fact, Paul in the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 26, he says, be angry and do not sin. That's actually a command. Be angry. Paul, the inspired apostle, commands his people to be angry, and yet he says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Give no opportunity for the devil. 
You see, anger just is not the problem. But allowing anger to fester overnight can lead to a problem. And in fact, doing so actually gives the devil an opportunity. The, the language used here, the word in Greek is tapos, which is, speaks of a physical place, just like your house. So to harbor unforgiveness, to in unfaithfully steward anger, literally is like giving the devil a place to mess around in your life. You see, anger is not the sin, but choosing to steward that anger through words of contempt absolutely is sin. Jesus raises the bar of righteousness from murder to anger, and as if that isn't enough, Jesus raises the bar of personal assault from weapons to words. We see this in verse 22, the second half. He says, you will be liable to the judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Now, this is where reading various translations of in the English language, you will find translators use different words here. In the ESV, which is what I was reading from, it says, whoever insults his brother. If you happen to be reading from the New American Standard, it would say, whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing. Or if you're reading the New International Version, it would say, whoever says to his brother, raka. And raka is the word that's in the Greek that is translated. And what that word is or what it means is it's just a put down relating to a lack of intelligence. In our modern day vernacular, we might choose a word like idiot or something like that. Or maybe we would use a two-word descriptor. You're like, you're empty-headed. That's the idea. We are insulting a person through words pointing directly at their intelligence. In the words of one of my favorite theologians, Buddy the Elf from that wonderful Christmas time classic, I'm just a cotton-headed ninny muggins. <laughs> That's the way Buddy would say it. That's the idea. He's insulting his own intelligence. And if we do that, Jesus says that we are liable to the council. We are liable to the Sanhedrin. So what is this Sanhedrin? What is this council that we're liable to if we choose to verbally assault somebody? That council is the highest indigenous governing body in Judea at the time. It's comprised of high priests, of elders, of scribes who were the, the scholars of the day. And the Sanhedrin had ultimate authority, not only in religious matters, but in legal and governmental affairs as well. They literally had authority over earthly condemnation. So if you insult your brother in any of these ways that Jesus just describes, you are liable to the Sanhedrin. He goes on to say, whoever says you fool, that's the most strongest statement that he makes here. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Now, the word translated you fool here is the Greek word more, and it's the root of our word that becomes moron, right? So what we are saying here is that we are putting down a person's character. Raka was an insult to the person's intelligence. Now we're talking about more than their intelligence. We're talking about their whole being, their whole character. We're speaking to some degree about their identity. And the bottom line here, folks, is that our words really matter. What we speak over a person will echo in their ears longer than we realize. In fact, these insults have a way of influencing our identity. This is why it was so offensive in ancient Jewish culture, because the people living in this culture were far more intentional about the name they gave to their children than we tend to be as Westerners. You see, they named their children with something that, that really was the identity that they were longing for that child to step into. And the insult in this culture would like erase the meaning and the, and the weight of magnitude of their original name, and it would replace it with this personal insult. So folks, we need to be careful what we say to people or about people, even behind their back. If you've been verbally assaulted, you know what this feels like. If you've had people call you names, even decades ago, 
you know that it continues to echo in your ears and you know the pain that that brings with it. A scholar, R.T. France, wrote a commentary on this passage and he says this, Ordinary insults may betray an attitude of contempt which God takes extremely seriously. You see, our words display the attitude of our heart. And that attitude usually is one of contempt, one where we view ourselves as higher than the person that we are putting down. And we stand over them in condemnation as though we're better than they are. And this contempt is something that God takes very seriously. And so seriously, in fact, that Jesus says, to do so, you are liable of the hell of fire. The word used here is Gehenna, Gehenna of fire, which really just means the Valley of Hinnom, which is a place that lies to the south and to the west of ancient city of Jerusalem. It's a place where people in the ancient times would offer human sacrifice to the pagan god of Molech. And sadly, even in Israel's history, there were a couple of their kings, King Ahaz and King Manasseh, who sacrificed their own sons in that valley of Gehenna as in uh, uh, trying to appease this pagan god, Molech. King Josiah, when he steps onto the throne, if you remember our Shadows series last Christmas, King Josiah was one of those righteous kings who found the Book of the Covenant, the, the law of God, read it, fell under conviction, and felt that he needed to make some reforms in Israel's practice. And one of the things he did is he, he uh, violated or desecrated this place of Gehenna, this Valley of Hinnom, so that it became a trash heap. This was a place where the refuse of Jerusalem was carried out and set on fire. Dead animals and, and everything unsightly was set out there. And it was always smoldering. And the worms were always decomposing the organic matter there. It was always burning. This is a place that, according to the New Testament, speaks of the place of final judgment. It became a concrete, tangible thing when Jesus said this, Everybody knew what it looked like in their mind. So he uses the concrete to describe the abstract idea of hell, eternal conscious punishment, never-ending fire, worms that are always breaking down organic matter. So Jesus here in Matthew 5 raises the bar of righteousness from murder weapons to insulting words. And again, we feel uncomfortable. We don't like the way this sounds because we all know that we're guilty of this. We're all guilty of using hateful words as we fight for what we believe to be right. We stand condemned. Far too often we use such words to describe political candidates. Or if you're like me and you're on the freeway and somebody cuts you off, you don't just mutter these words, you yell them at the windshield. Maybe we speak that way to our boss or of our boss, or coworkers, or sadly of our spouse, or that difficult child. Every one of us knows what it's like to use words of insult that speak to someone's lack of intelligence or speak to someone's lack of character. And if we're honest, we just have to admit that this bar is just too high to be reached. We are guilty of judgment and liable of the hell of fire, according to Jesus' words here in Matthew 5. Jesus raises that bar to the point where we're forced to realize that we just can't reach it. And in fact, we never will reach it. We have wronged others, and according to this righteous standard, we don't have hope. We need Jesus to reach this standard as our substitute. And when he does, and when we trust him, he still says that you must do something about the wrongs you have spoken over somebody else. We pick this up in verses 23 through 26, and here we find that Jesus raises the bar of our horizontal relationships. So, verse 23 starts with so. He's already taught us that he's raised the bar from murder to anger, from weapons to words, 
And as a result, he says, so if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go. Because God's standard for unrighteousness includes unrighteous anger, and because his standard for assault includes common insults, Jesus tells us to place a priority on reconciling our horizontal human relationships. Jesus says it's not okay for us to sit here worshiping God if we are harboring contempt for another human in our heart. And we've all failed to clear this bar. We stand before him here condemned. We stand before him assuming that we're right. Everything's good with you and me, right God? And he says, leave your gift. Leave it before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. You see, God doesn't want us to think that all is well between him and us if we still have unresolved relational issues with another human being. That's why Celebrate Recovery gets it right. They include in their 12 steps, two steps that force us to get these horizontal relationships right because the goal of Celebrate Recovery is to get the vertical relationship right as well. And there is clear link between horizontal relationships and the vertical. Step eight in Celebrate Recovery says this, we made a list of all persons that we had harmed and became willing to make amends with them all. You literally sit down and you take an inventory and you write down the names of the people that you have insulted or the names of people that you have a breached relationship with and you get willing in the spirit to make amends. And step nine, then you make direct amends to such people whenever, wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Folks, we must do something about this. God feels so strongly about it that he commands us to leave our gift and go. And for some of us, faithful application of this passage of scripture means we push stop on the recording right now and you go and you get right with that person that you have a disagreement with that person that you have offended. Maybe you pick up your phone and you send them a text and say, hey, can we get together sometime in the next week? I've realized that I've got some things I need to confess before you. Because until we're right with that other person, we can't pretend to be right with God. Does my suggestion that you stop listening to this message until you're right with somebody else seem too radical for you? Does that seem like too high a cost to be willing to pay? Consider what it cost the people that Jesus is speaking to. These are people who were here in the temple offering a sacrifice to God. Most likely that sacrifice was a living animal. And for them, obeying Jesus' words mean you leave that animal there and you travel back home. Maybe it took hours, maybe it took days to travel home. And then you track down that person that you had offended and you get time with them in their schedule and you repent before them. You confess your sin and you take the time that it takes, however long it takes, to get right with them. And then you travel back to Jerusalem, hours or days. And then, God says, you can continue to offer that sacrifice. Do you have a category for being that radical in your relationship with the Lord where you would be willing to suspend your worship of him in order to get right with that brother or that sister? Why? Why would Jesus say this? Why does God take this this seriously? The short answer, God hates hypocrisy. He's always hated hypocrisy. He spoke this through the prophet Isaiah to his people who were in that state. He says, what to me, this is Isaiah chapter 1, beginning at verse 11. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? 
Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moon and the Sabbath and the calling of convocations, I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. And even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. That's God's heart. He doesn't want our worship if we're not living out a life of godliness. Jesus reminds us in Matthew chapter 9 and in Matthew chapter 12, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, says the Lord. So let's not pretend that we are good if there's unresolved anger and conflict between you and your fellow man or your fellow woman. James speaks about this, the idea of slandering somebody with our tongues. James talks about it in chapter 3, beginning at verse 8. He says, But no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil. It's full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. And the Apostle John picks up and says a yes and amen in his epistle, his first epistle, 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. If anyone says, I love God, and yet hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Folks, the degree to which we love God is displayed by how we regard and treat other human beings. Our vertical relationship with God can't be business as usual if there's even one unreconciled horizontal relationship with another person here on earth. And you might say, wait, does that mean I can never have a disagreement? The, question, the, the bottom line is you need to discern two things. You need to discern the truth of the disagreement. Is the other person in disagreement with you because you've really offended them? Have you truly said or done things that have offended them, things that you need to own, things that you need to confess? Or are they having a breach in their relationship with you because they are believing a lie? Matthew 5, verse 11 says, Blessed are you when others revile you or persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. So are they harboring something against you in truth because you've actually wronged them or falsely? You are not liable for the things, the lies that they're harboring, but you are liable for the things that you have done or said that you need to own, that you need to confess. The second thing that you need to discern is that portion that depends on you. Romans chapter 12 verse 18 says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. So, if you have something to own, something to confess, uh, you've done a deed that, that dishonored them, or you've said words that have dishonored them, you need to confess that. You need to act on it as far as it depends on you. Now, this means that if you are a victim of abuse, you are not on the hook to make that right. You ownership of this is not yours to harbor. And you need grace to heal from that abuse. And we'd love to come alongside of you and help you in that. But for most of us, we just need to sit with the Lord and listen to, Lord, what is my portion of wrong in this breached relationship that I need to confess before that person? And when you sit with that person and you confess and you ask them to forgive you and they grant that forgiveness, that's when reconciliation happens. And to the degree that they don't grant you forgiveness, 
you're not on the hook for that portion that doesn't lie with you. You are only obligated under God's authority to take ownership of that which is yours, as far as it depends on you. So church, the bar has been raised from murder to anger, from weapons to words. And as a result, God says that unresolved horizontal conflict, it hinders vertical worship. Hypocrisy deafens God's ears to the, our prayers. And if we want God to hear our prayers, we must heed his command to reconcile our horizontal relationships. So what do we do? As I've thought and prayerfully processed through this, I think there's at least five points of application that each of us needs to act on. First, realize that none of us can reach this bar. It's just far too high. We can't do it on our own. We are living examples of what Jesus said in John 15. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Secondly, we must recognize that Jesus cleared this bar as our substitute. Jesus did it. He didn't abolish the law. He didn't relax the law. He perfectly fulfilled the law. Yeah, the bar is high and Jesus cleared it. And he did so as your substitute, as my substitute. Thirdly, in light of those truths, we just need to rest in his finished work of reconciliation. Receive the grace that is ours through faith in Christ and trust him. Fourth, I think we should wonder, marvel, at what a safe environment the kingdom of heaven will be in glory. Because remember, Jesus is teaching about the truth of what will characterize citizens of the kingdom. That means, in, according to today's passage, it'll be a safe place. No murder, no anger. We can marvel at this. We can long for it. And fifth, we're obligated by this passage to work to make these kingdom realities increasingly true in our own spheres of influence, right where you're at, in your home, in your workplace, in your city, in your county, in our country. We can work to make these kingdom realities increasingly true. And the way we work at that is we follow steps eight and nine from Celebrate Recovery. We take an inventory regularly. Lord, have I wronged anybody? And as a name comes to mind, we write it down. And then we go make amends with them. We come to terms quickly, according to verse 25 from this passage. Now remember, Jesus is teaching about those things that are true about those who are citizens of God's kingdom. And one day, when that kingdom comes in fullness, it will be true of every citizen. Not only will there be no murder in God's kingdom, there won't even be a single thought of ill will about another person. Can you wrap your mind around that? A place where there's not even a thought of ill will, of disagreement with another person. Can you even wrap your mind around how safe a place that this will be? You will be safe from the abuse of others. Think about that. You will be safe from the abuse of others. And others will be safe from the abuse that you bring to the equation. This is our future. This is our reality. When we step over that threshold into eternity in Christ, this is the safety of the environment that we will be living in forever. And folks, Jesus calls us to live in that way right now. On this earth, on this side of glory. This is to be increasingly true of us, the citizens of his kingdom. And that's the challenge. That's the invitation. Recognize you can't reach the bar. Recognize Jesus reached it as our substitute. Trust him and obey him and we will step into that safe environment one day, even as we're bringing it into our current realities today. That's the call, folks. It's exactly what Jesus is calling us to right here. So let's lean in and let's obey.
Let's get right with those people that are in disagreement with us. Let's confess our sin before one another that we may be healed. Let's pray. Father, we look to you. We call on you. We thank you for the truth of this passage. We thank you that the bar hasn't been lowered, that we might step over it, but it's been raised impossibly high that we are forced to trust Jesus. And trusting Jesus, you give us your indwelling Holy Spirit that empowers us and enables us to recognize sin, to name it as sin, to confess it before you and before others. As awkward or as uncomfortable as that might be, your grace is sufficient for us in that. So I pray for myself, I pray for my brothers and sisters, Lord, whoever we need to get things right with horizontally, would you motivate us and, and bring that about? today even, so that we might have right relationship with you and enjoy those things that are true about citizens of your kingdom. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks, ABC family. Thanks again for tuning in. And I'll be praying that those people that need to hear your confession, those people that you need to get that relationship right with, I'll be praying that you take that step, and I'll be praying that it'll bear beautiful fruit to the glory of God. Thank you. We love you. We'll see you again.